From the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Unsettled Dust by Robert Eichmann Robert Eichmann wrote some of the most highly praised ghost stories of the century and was widely regarded as the greatest practitioner of the form during his lifetime. It was written about him that he was the most terrifyingly intrepid explorer of the classical ghost story, and his tales are vital reading for anyone fond of the form. During the period of my work, a special duties officer for the Historic Structures Fund. I have inevitably come upon many strange and unexpected things in all fields, but only three times that I can recollect have I so far encountered anything that might be thought to involve an element of the paranormal. Since interest in paranormal phenomena appears to be growing steadily, partly, no doubt, as an escape from a way of life that seems every day to grow more uniform regulated and unambitious, I had thought for some time that it might be worthwhile to set out at least one of these cases, the most striking, I think, of the three, in an orderly though completely frank narrative, separated from the many other documents connected with my employment. It is not a matter of struggling for half-lost memories, since for the most part the task consists in adapting extracts from my diary for the period of time concern. I have now been special duties officer for just over 10 years, and I think the moment has come to set about the task. It so happens that it has been during those 10 years that the fund has set up a psychic and occult research committee. As is well known, the council hesitated for many years before taking this step, having in mind the extreme undesirability of the fund involving itself in controversy of any kind, and also the constant danger of its being charged with crankiness or reaction, but in the end the pressure became so great that a response could no longer be avoided. I think it was inevitable. The link between an interest in old buildings, often ruinous and sometimes a skill, and an interest in what are popularly called ghosts is obvious. Also the fund, like most established voluntary societies, is supported mainly by the elderly, a psychic committee was and is as respectable as the animals committee that has been with us almost from the start. The P and O research committee has undoubtedly done much good work, but I have hesitated to deliver to them a report of my own, despite the fact that I am possibly in a position to deliver three. The fund is a very conservative organization, not in the party sense, of course, and my dilemma is that of a civil servant. If a civil servant takes an initiative and things go right with it, he cannot, in the nature of his employment, look for much in the way of reward. Whereas, if his initiative goes wrong, he can expect all kinds of trouble. Everything from a reprimand to blocked promotion and a permanent black mark against his name in the files. It is accepted, therefore, that the way to advance in the civil service or in any field where civil service conditions prevail, is never to take an initiative and never to support anyone else's. It is inevitable that this should be so, as long as we base all our administration on the bureaucratic model. 
The fund is not as hard a master as a civil service, of course, if only because no one had to answer to Parliament for its actions. But caution is compelled upon by its sheer size and by its obligation to offend no one, if this can possibly be avoided, not even its direct critics. A report, even if carefully edited, delivered by me to the P&O people on any one of my three cases could, in my judgment, lead to contention, to unpopularity in various quarters for the author, and conceivably even to a libel action in which the fund would be involved. There are few subjects on which people are more touchy than the supernatural, as they call it. It is the measure of the importance they attach to it, even if few of them care to admit it. The delivery of such a report would hardly be construed by the council as lying within my duties, if trouble resulted. One can but speculate upon the mass of important information which never sees the light of day for similar reasons. I have thought it best to confine the circulation of my narrative to a few selected people, binding them in advance to the strictest confidence and to place a copy for posterity in my small archives. The position of special duties officer, of which I have so far been the only incumbent, was created within the growth of the fund and the number and variety of its properties conjured up a miscellany of tasks often urgent, but all outside the scope of any member of a staff which had been recruited almost solely for duties connected with preservation in the strictest sense, and which, as was freely admitted at the time, was often by then advanced in service. My ploys have varied from setting up a large bequest of sculpture in a once ducal park to organizing a sailing boat harbor on an island off the Welsh coast, from a frustrating six months devoted to relaying an ornamental paving to an even longer period spent to promote an open-air season of fertility plays with singing and dancing. Most of my work has been done in the open air, trying to dodge the British climate, the local authority Philistines, and the fund's own members, so many of whom have ideas of their own and think they have bought the entire staff with their own small subscriptions. Well, not all, perhaps. Some of the members are very nice people and eager to offer their hospitality. I've had my moments of cynicism when I have felt that all that has mattered of the fund's works has rested on my single shoulders. But that was mere self-pity, and I really know quite well what I have done much better as a fund officer than I could expect to do in any other job. I fell right on my feet when the fund engaged me. The events I am about to describe took place at Clamber Court in Bedfordshire, a seat of the Breakspear family, the family of which one branch is said to have provided the only Englishman ever to be Pope, who was also the Pope with the greatest physical strength of all the Popes. The Clamber Court branch was represented by two unmarried sisters. Their father, the last Lord St. Adrian, had died years before, and their mother was said to have been a little queer ever since. At least that was the gossip around the fund office. In the end, the girls had settled Clamber on the fund, but remained there themselves as fund tenants. The same office gossip said that the girls had lived very wildly at one time, having no one to control them, and had got through a lot of money. Explanations like that might have been true in former times, but there's seldom much in them nowadays. It is far more likely that the Breakspears were orphans of the social storm, like most of the fund's clients. My sojourn in the house had nothing to do with the building itself, or with the surrounding property, as I shall explain in a moment, but it so happens that I paid clamor one previous visit. It had not been in the course of my duties, which do not include any kind of regular round. I went there as an ordinary fund member, without disclosing anything more. In those early days, I often found it instructive to do this, and to note how my colleagues were faring in their endless struggle with the different buildings often near to collapse, even when offered to the fund, and with the odd and recalcitrant people who lived in them. In those days, the fund's age president frequently described the staff as an extra-large family, and it was by no means only a cliché. One felt the presence of the fund wherever one went, watching how one behaved and difficult to get away from. Of course, I felt much more at home in a year or two, much more sure of my ground, 
when it came to my going to places like Clamber Court, it should also be remembered that I had worked at one time in architecture, though I never qualified, and so had an interest in buildings for their own sake. Naturally, that is true of many of the fun staff. Clamber Court proved to be a square four-storied brick pile with on each side a square, two-storied, smaller brick pavilion. The pavilions had slate roofs coming to points and pilasters on three sides. They were linked to the main block by lengthy one-story passages with big circular topped windows. This branch of the large Breakspear family had become rich at the time of the Hanoverian succession and had then entered upon a new period of importance, drifting so far from the other branches that ultimately no heir could be found to the title. A conspicuous feature of the property was two very long drives. The first one led from the front of the house that straight down a two-mile avenue of fine old trees to a noble ornamental gateway on the main road. The other ran less straight, but at no less length from a pretty lodge, at the east to a related lodge on the west, also on the main road. The drives crossed at about a quarter of a mile from the front of the house. At the point of intersection was a baroque fountain with a heroic male figure about to drive a spear into a fat boar. I found it an uncomfortable group, but redeemed by all the too, un too unusual excellence of its condition and maintenance. In modern Europe, most estate fountains are broken, sordid, and regarded with indifference, even by their owners. This one shimmered, and supreme marvel actually spouted water, quite probably at the proper force. I had already noted that the drive down which I had driven my mini, the transverse drive, was clean and weeded, the gate painted, the gate man respectful. I now observed that every pane of glass in the two long corridors from the main house to the pavilions appeared to be in place and gleaming in the spring sun. The fun cannot always afford perfections of that kind. Almost certainly the Breakspears must have had something left in the kitty. The interior of the house confirmed this. Not only did it contain many objects of real excellence, but it was painted, tended, and polished. There was no sagging wallpaper, no holes in the ceiling. On the other hand, I could not say that the house was dusted. This was curious. One might have written names in the deposit on the gleaming surface, as Rembrandt did in Quartus Film. Indeed, I did write Historic Structures Fund on the top of a dining room table and the words stood out quite clearly in the light of a sunbeam. The odd thing was that one of the house employees, a tall gray woman in a gray nylon wrapper, just watched me do it from the other side of the room and said nothing at all, though she was presumably stationed to keep an eye on the behavior of the public. I particularly noticed that she didn't even smile at what I had done. I was so surprised by the dust in the house and by the indifference shown to it that the next day I sent a memo to the fund's regional representative. I suggested that there might be a cement works in the district, an idea that occurred to me during the night, and that the fund should possibly require all the house windows to be kept shut. That was nine years ago. Two years later I was required to stay in the house for, as my diary confirms, 18 days. The reason was the need to superintend one of the maddest schemes in which the fund ever entangled itself. Indeed, the maddest of all, as I said at the time, when anyone asked me, and as events have since confirmed, to me very sincere regret, the so-called recovery of the River Boval. For years, there had been complaints in various quarters, none of them, of course, in full possession of the facts, that the fund was too conservationist and backward-looking, too little prepared to enter the field and do battle. The worst consequence of this uninformed agitation was that the fund found itself saddled with the project for cleaning out the weeds and mud from this small local river that no one had ever heard of, not even the people who lived in the district, as I soon found, and patching up the broken down locks. The view that I and others expressed was the obvious one, but if there was any real demand for the river, then the proper public authorities could be depended upon to attend to it. The matter was simply nothing to do with the objectives of the fund. But there was the usual group of hotheads, with not enough work to do it in the world as one could not but feel, and they had interested one of the local landowners in putting up a little money, though only one landowner, 
and nothing like enough money. They said that most of the work could be done by volunteers and that the public would find the rest of the finance. Needless to say, neither claim proved to be true, and the whole business committed the fund to endless travail by no means ended yet nor likely to be. The fund is simply not equipped for a struggle, argument, and publicity. Nor has my own experience disposed me in favor of what are called voluntary workers. In practice, much more is always achieved by regular salaried staff, keeping themselves out of the limelight. And so it has proved in the case of the Bovo project. But if I say more on that topic, I shall be suspected of disloyalty to the fund council, which would be quite wrong. It is more a case of loyalty being often best shown by preventing mistakes being made. After, in my view, insufficient discussion, the Bovo project was agreed to, and the hottest and most thrusting of the hotheads put in charge of the actual works, a man named Hand. I myself didn't think he was altogether an Englishman, but it was obvious that he was very young for the degree of responsibility in which he had involved himself. So I was asked to look after him during the first stages of the work, as I was twenty or more years older and had gained experience from a wide variety of different jobs. Hamish Haythorne, the national security of the fund, wrote to Miss Agnes Breakspear, reputedly the more businesslike sister, to ask if I could stay at Clamber Court while I was launching the scheme. The fund expects people whose properties have been accepted to help in this way, as the need may arise, though sometimes fund employees find themselves offered only an addict and very simple fare. This had by then happened to me several times, and I was quite prepared for it at Clamber Court. Nowadays, of course, in my case, it hardly ever happens, because I have learned to enter into the different foibles of the fund's tenants. I remember that Miss Breakspear took a long time to answer at all, and all the while the Boval scheme was held up. But we heard from her in the end, and off I went that very afternoon. I arrived in good time for dinner, though that, as I have just said, might not have meant very much. There was a long tradition that the great gates on the main road were opened only for family weddings, family funerals, and visits to the sovereign, and the smaller gate further up the same road had been padlocked by the fund's regional representative because it had proved impossible to find a tenant for the adjoining lodge owing to the noise of the traffic so that I wound my way in my mini through the lanes leading to the eastern entry as I had done two years before. Had perhaps been not quite as much as that because now it was earlier in the spring, with not yet a leaf on any of the big old trees. In fact, not yet officially spring at all. This time the man at the gate was wearing a hat, which he touched to an opening for me. My spirits rose as I saw that the long winding drive was as spruce as before. All the hedges within view had been properly laid, and many of the farm gates had been renewed. The hero huntsman, when at length I reached him, was enshrined among complex traceries of water, and the doomed quarry a drip with it. The house, I thought, as I completed the finishing stretch up to the wide parterre of rectangular stones before the double staircase, looked immaculate but unfunctional, like a vast Staffordshire model. When I stopped my engine and stepped out, the complete silence contributed to the illusion. I stood for a moment, looking down the slow descent to the great gates and watching big black rooks reel like sheets of burnt newspaper between the bare trees, the only life there was. Hello, said a casual voice from above. Come in. Standing with her hands on the balustrade at the top of the two flights of steps was a woman, plainly one of my two hostesses, though I had never then knowingly signed either. I wavered, as one does, between ascending the right-hand steps to the left but she said nothing and just watched me. I am Olive Breakspear, she said as I arrived, and held out her hand. I should have expected the hand to be cold, as it was one of those fine March days which often seem the chilliest of the year, but it was not. You're my landlord. In my experience, the tenants always either said something like that, or alternatively did everything to pretend that the relationship was the other way around. Miss Brigsby, however, was an unusual figure. She was well above average height for a woman, and six or eight inches above mine, and remarkably slender and well-shaped. 
though tough and wiry looking. The last impression was reinforced by the fact that she was wearing worn brown riding breeches, worn brown riding boots, and a dark blue shirt open at the neck and with the sleeves rolled up. Her face, neck, and forearms were all tanned and browned, even though it was the end of the winter. Her face was striking because she had strong, prominent bones, large, melancholy eyes, and a big rectangular mouth, but some might have said that her head was too long, her cheeks too sunken. She had straight, reddish-brown hair, starting rather far back on the brow. It was glossy and well-kept like the mane of a racehorse, but worn shoulder length and curled outward at the ends, after the fashion which prevailed during the Second World War. It was very difficult to guess how old she was. Her physical style was one which is eminently durable. I was watching the rooks, she said. Sometimes when the trees are bare and the light beginning to go, I do it for an hour at a time. Looking at her in her blue shirt, I am sure I must have shivered. Come on in or you'll get cold, said Miss Brakespear. The big oblong pillared hall contained only formal furniture, though I was pleased to observe a heap of the fund's official blue-covered guidebook to the house. The wide door had lain open while Miss Brakespear stood outside, so that the cavernous room was cold and echoey, especially as there was no fire. It was also dim, as evening was descending and Miss Brakespear had not turned on the light. She went before me up the dark main staircase, taking two steps at a time, with her swinging stride. Impeded by my bundle, I followed her much less gracefully. We turned leftwards along a high, wide passage, which traversed the first floor of the house, with big white doors opening into silent rooms on either side. I had not previously been upstairs, because the rooms open to the public were all below. Miss Brakespear's step and her riding boots were sharp and swift, whereas I am sure that I merely shuffled. At the eastern end of the passage, Miss Brakespear opened the door to my, my room. At least I had not been relegated to one of those designed for occupation by the servants. It was a big square dark red room with a heavy dado, two windows looking down the long avenue, a modern double bed and a general look of having been furnished by a good contractor in perhaps 1910. Turn on the light if you like, said Miss Brakespear, unless you prefer the dusk as I do. There's a bathroom opposite. It's all for you, because nowadays there's never anyone else on this side of the house. My sister and I sleep at the other end. Elizabeth Craw, our housekeeper, sleeps upstairs, and the two girls in the village. You'll find the whole house quiet for your work until the open season begins at Easter. Come down for a drink when you're ready, and the music room to the left of the hall. She strode away down the dark passage, leaving my bedroom door open. She had a rich and liquid voice, rather beautiful, and a casual inflection which one felt never varied, no matter what she was saying or to whom. I noticed that she had not mentioned her mother, who was supposed to live somewhere in the house also. I shut the door and stood in the middle of the room waiting. I might well have been waiting for the twilight to come, more like darkness, so that even by Miss Brakespeare's standard, I could turn on the light with a good conscience. Then I realized how absurd this was and pressed the switch. The result was disappointing. The only light in the room came from three rather faint bulbs attached to a brass frame which the 1910 contractor had suspended from the plaster rose in the center of the coffered ceiling. They would effectively illumine neither a reader in bed nor maker up or report writer at the heavy dressing table. I felt that from the park my room must look little more luminous than in the year the house was built. I unpacked a few things and stowed them away. I set my book hopefully by the side of the bed. Christopher Hussey's The Picturesque, I see in my diary that it was. I cased the room for heat of any kind. There was none. I wondered if I should change into something darker, but decided that I could decide while taking my drink, as it was still early enough to change after it if that seemed appropriate. I crossed the passage to the bathroom. Here the electric light seemed a little stronger. I looked at my hands as one does after a journey to see how travel-stained they are. They were filthy. I was astonished, and I turned the tap of the wash basin. Of course, there was nothing like that in my bedroom. 
I worried about having shaken hands with Miss Breakspear. Then I realized that the grime had spread from the darker patches at the tips of my fingers and that I had probably picked it up in my bedroom. And only then did I remember about the dust I had noticed on my previous visit to the house. The fact had not lately been in my mind. I remembered also about the memo on the subject which I had sent to old Blantyre, the impoverished country gentleman who acted as the fund's regional representative in that area. Thinking about it now, I was almost sure that Blantyre had never even sent an acknowledgement, so that, most certainly, he had taken no action whatever. I let the water run and run, but it never ran hot. I remembered the beautiful music room quite well. As I stood in the dark hall outside the thick closed door, I could just hear the sound of a piano within. Real music in the music room of a British mansion is today so rare that at first I took it for granted that the wireless had been turned on. But when I opened the door and entered, I saw that Miss Breakspear was herself playing. She did not stop when I walked in, but merely indicated with a movement of her head that I should sit down. The gesture seemed quite friendly, but she did not smile. I suspected that Miss Breakspear smiled seldom. In here, a big log fire burnt, the supply of logs rough and knotty, being piled high in a vast circular bin of chased brass, itself gleaming like a yellow furnace. I know nothing about music, but it seemed to me that Miss Breakspear played the piano much as she talked, beautifully, but with a casualness that was not so much indifference as a reflection of melancholy and resignation. There was no music before her, and no light by which she could have read it. Quite possibly she was improvising, though she seemed this was nonsense on my part. She played on and on. I found that I was pleased to warm myself right through at rather long last, and to listen to her and watch her dim shape by the light of the fire. I could see that she was still wearing her riding clothes, with the tips of her boots on the pedals. I am not sure how much time passed in this way, but certainly it was quite dark outside the uncurtained windows, when the door opened and a third person stood there. It was another woman. I could not see her at all clearly, but I could see the shape of her dress and the outline of her hair. She stood for a while with the door still open behind her. Miss Breakspear went on playing, as if in a trance with herself. Then the newcomer shut the door and turned on the light, more effective lighting than in the rooms above. At once Miss Breakspear broke off. Dreaming, asked the newcomer, non too agreeably, I thought. Miss Breakspear made no direct reply. Agnes, she said, this is Mr. Oxenhope, at once our landlord and our guest. Mr. Oxenhope, let me introduce my sister Agnes. The other Miss Breakskeeper. Hereafter I must call them Olive and Agnes, though I do not find it comes very naturally, seemed little interested. How do you do, she said in an offhand way from the door. How do you do, I replied. Now that the lights were on, I glanced above for dust. You really are a fool, said Agnes to her sister, and walked over to the fire. One could have said she spoke in affectionate derision, as is the way within a family, the alternative common being silence. But I might rather have called it habitual derision. Except, accepted derision. Olive closed the piano and got up. At that exact distance from me, and by fairly strong artificial light, her neck inside the open collar of her dark shirt looked more withered and less shapely than I had thought. How did the meeting go? she asked quietly. Exactly as expected, replied Agnes, standing before the blaze, her feet slightly apart, her hands behind her back. She was of an entirely different physical shape from her sister a squarish, fattish woman of about my height, with a thickening face and neck, dark eyes and abundant dark hair and a style more fashionable than her sister's. She wore a plain dress and thick purple wool and black high-heeled shoes. She might have been described by an enemy as too heavily made up, but that is a difficult problem for a woman of her build and period of life, even though I should not have cared to assess her exact age within a range of perhaps twenty years.' 
As will be gathered, she seemed very much more the customary Englishwoman than her sister, and she had something of the frustration and suppressed, long-lost feeling that goes with the customary Englishwoman, however banal the customary manifestation of it. When one spends one's time going round the different properties of the historic structures fun, one grows to learn the essential characteristics of the customary Englishwoman. Olive had unlocked an ebony and ivory cabinet and was getting us drinks. There was no further reference to the meeting that had been mentioned. Indeed, there was silence. I knew that it was for me to help things along, but I could think of nothing to say. Agnes saved me the trouble. What are you feeling for, she asked. It seemed appallingly observant of her. I thought I'd drop by my handkerchief I improvised, perhaps more readily than convincingly. Mr. Oxen's hope's visit has nothing to do with the house, said Olive, conciliant theory. It was excellently intended, no doubt, but the form of words suggested that she too had cottoned on, because I had, of course, been feeling, as Agnes had put it, for dust. And what was more, I had been doing it without being aware of it, Needless to say, it was very discourteous of me, socially speaking. And his gropings have nothing to do with his handkerchief, said Agnes dryly. With either of his handkerchiefs, the one in his sleeve or the pretty one in his breast pocket? Do you carry three handkerchiefs, Mr. Oxenhope? No, I replied calmly, we were sitting here in the dark, and I thought the handkerchief had fallen out of my sleeve. I believe you, Mr. Oxenhope. Sitting in the dark is the only thing my sister really likes doing. Not altogether, said Olive, as you might guess. I like writing, too. Do you write? I'm afraid I don't. As a matter of fact, I had thought of trying to take it up when I began to realize what my work with the fun would be like. But Hamish Haythorne has strongly advised me against it, saying that it was a mistake to meet the tenants on their own ground. I have since wondered whether Haythorne's view was not affected by the fact that he could neither write himself nor be conceived as capable of it. But no doubt this was more malice on my part. Just as well for you, said Agnes. Going writing with my sister is an act of desperation. I'm sorry all the same, I said, looking at Olive as I spoke and trying to meet her eyes because self-sufficient though she might seem, I was growing sorry for her, as well as for myself. Sherry asked Olive, either avoiding my glance or being unaware of my intention, or Gin, or Pascato. Pascato's an aperitif that Agnes brings back from one of her committees. It's Elizabethan, and based on quince juice. Or would you prefer whiskey? I thought that I had better make some effort to appease Agnes, as so she volunteered. So I volunteered for the Pescado. Very few people like it," said Agnes. The evening continued to be uneasy. The sisters were, at the least, utterly bored with one another. Such communication as they attempted was confined to jibing and belittlement. As at the start, most of the attacking seemed to come from Agnes but I thought this might have been partly because Olive gave the impression of having years ago said all she had to say, and of by now preferring to sit in silence. Later that evening it seemed to me, however, that Olive on several occasions struck home on her own, though Agnes each time behaved as if she were too stupid to understand. It might have been the fact of the matter, but I doubted it. The sisters had obviously been committed to this form of exercise for years, and every sentence and every small action had overtones and undertones soaring and sinking beyond the apprehension of any outsider. I, of course, attempted intermittently to make general conversation, but Agnes was antagonistic, and Olive, though perfectly polite, was indifferent and world-weary. One might have said that Olive knew it all already, but I doubted whether she really did. I suspected that she fought off knowing and that it was really Agnes who knew much more. One often finds this with women of Agnes's type, 
I perhaps make it all sound as if I was having a dreadful time, and it is certainly true that I was not enjoying myself, but by then I was surprisingly accustomed to such family sessions in the houses I visited. I had found them to be common, perhaps as patrician standards merge with plebeian ones, and there is less opportunity for the graces of entertainment as distinct from the utilities. The new conditions take different people in different ways, but are seldom to the advantage of guests. There seemed to be no question of any clothes being changed for dinner. When we entered the dining room, the big polished table was as dusty beneath the shaded candles as it had been when I saw it two years earlier in the sunlight, and the tall gray woman who stood there waiting for us was recognizably she who had watched my writing on it with my finger. Supposing that Agnes would be observing me, I tried to avoid all reaction. Dinner was good and the wine excellent, but conversation there was almost none. The presence of the great servant, still by the way in a gray nylon wrapper, seemed to prevent the sisters even from bickering. I felt that every little went into the house, not even ordinary news, let alone what are called ideas. It would be very difficult for the Breakspear sisters to have many friends. Apart from foodstuffs and practicalities, I felt that almost nothing and nobody entered but the public visitors in summer. By definition, aloof and alien, merely staring in through the bars, and even then, uncomprehending of everything that mattered, even when occasionally qualified to discriminate between Messin and Niffenberg. And, as I had seen for myself, the visitors to Clamber Court, though according to Highthorne, increasing slightly in number, were powerless to dispel the dust. On the dining room table, it was so thick it marked my cuffs. I observed circles left in it by platters or glasses that had been removed, became inconspicuous within minutes, and by the time the meal was finished, had almost vanished, though not quite, when one carried the exact spot in one's mind and looked keenly. But the fare was fine, and every few of the fund houses of any had I been offered such wine, let alone anywhere else. I knew this even though I was by no means a connoisseur, little more than of music. Back in the music room after dinner, a right discussion started about the ethics of coursing. I could contribute little. The sisters disagreed about reafforestation and later about the flowers that were being planted for the benefit of the summer visitors. My views were hardly sought. I imagined that Agnes would have despised them and all have pitied them. Ultimately, Agnes said that she must get on with the accounts and sat by the fire making entries in a black book with a pile of bills and receipts on the floor at her feet. You won't mind, you won't mind being treated as one of the family, she had said to me before starting this labor. Olive suggested that I might care to look for a book in the library. It was a well-known to be a very fine library, largely assembled by Lord St. Adrian of the early 18th century and hardly disturbed since. But I said that I was in the middle of a book I had brought with me and that I might fetch it down from my bedroom in a moment. I made no further move because I have always had difficulty in reading when the company of others, let alone the company of strangers. Instead, I turned over the pages of Country Life and Field, dusty back numbers of which lay about the room, looking almost unopened. They would have to be burnt or stacked before the public season opened. Olive merely sat in front of the fire, with her long legs stretched out towards it. Her eyes remained open, but almost expressionless, too resigned, I thought, even to look sad. I was sure that she would have returned to the piano if Agnes had not been there. Olive was by no means in her first youth, but there was something appealing about her, and though it may not be a suitable comment for even this confidential record, I thought by no means for the first time in such surroundings what an odd way it was for people of opposite sexes to spend the evening, when, after all, there was nothing ahead that any of us could be sure of but infirmity, illness, and death. It is strange that people train themselves so carefully to go to waste so prematurely.
Every now and then Agnes wondered sharply whether I would mind adding something up or working something out for her, and surprisingly briskly some of these small tasks of hers proved to be. Olive never even sighed. In the end the great servant appeared. The sisters addressed her as Elizabeth and brought in a large bowl of fruit. What time would you like breakfast? Agnes asked me. What time would best suit you? I responded politely. Elizabeth will bring it to your room, said Agnes. We go our own ways. I suggested a time and the great servant departed. I understand you'll be fully occupied throughout the day, asked Agnes. Very fully, I replied, remembering where I was there for and for. Then we shall see you tonight? I expressed assent and gratification. Over oranges and apples, the evening ended. Agnes ate nothing, but as well as an apple, I accepted from Olive a whiskey, and she herself consumed a noticeably stronger one. Already on our first evening together, we were running out of generalities. More whiskey, asked Olive, after a munching silence. I accepted, though it was unlike me. She refilled my glass to the same strength as her own. The curious dust lay all around me in the warm light. There was some clattering of bolts and chains, some checking of locks and hasps, all Agnes's work. Don't wait, she said, but we did, and all ascended the stairs together. The sisters turned to the right, where I turned to the left, but had not even shut the door of my imperfectly lighted room when I heard familiar steps approaching along the passage and Olive stood in the doorway. I just came to say I'm sorry we're so dull, she spoke in her usual non-committal voice, but softly, perhaps so that Agnes could have no chance of overhearing. I'm sorry I don't write, I said, and I still think it was clever of me to think of it so quickly. Yes, said Olive, it's a pity, especially where we can do so little to entertain you. The company of two middle-aged sisters who don't get on isn't much fun. I don't see you as middle-aged at all, I replied, whether I did or not. I saw Olive as most attractive, especially at that moment when she stood slender and poetical in my doorway and both of us were about to go to bed. But she made no response. She did not even smile. There was merely a moment's silence between us. Then she said, I'll ap I apologize for us. Good night. And walked quickly away. I found myself thinking of her for a long time and being kept from sleep by the thought. My breakfast arrived at the exact moment I had named. The grave factum woke me when she knocked. Having fallen asleep belatedly, I had then slept deeply. It seemed very cold. Without thinking about it, I swept the dust off the polished bedside table with my pajama sleeve. Then I realized that the gray Elizabeth, who was putting down my tray on the table, might take my actions as a slight. The dust seems to blow in again as soon as it swept away, I said, shivering in my unheated bedroom, and in the tone of one making an excuse for another. There must be some dusty new industry near the house. It blows in off the drive, said Elizabeth. The drives are always dusty. If that's what it is, I think something might be done. I'll have a word with Mr. Blantyre about it. He might arrange to have the drives tarmacked anyway near the house. The dust is really rather terrible. After all, I was one who had some indirect responsibility in the matter. Terrible, as you say, said Elizabeth noncommittally, but please don't bother. There's nothing to be done about it. She spoke with surprising authoritiveness, as if she, and not the Breakspear sisters, were the fund's tenant, or rather, perhaps, still the landowner. To argue would naturally have been a mistake, so continuing to shiver in the cold of the morning, I asserted that the coffee on the tray would suit me well, and that there was no need to change it as she had suggested, for tea. I found it hard to accept Elizabeth's explanation of the omnipresent dust. It was true that the drives were dusty, noticeably so, quite like what I imagine country roads to have been in the early days of motoring. 
when veils and goggles had to be worn and the back of the neck thickly muffled. But there was so much dust in the house and with so many of the windows shut, at least during the winter. For example, I had not opened mine on going to bed the previous evening, though this was contrary to a rule of health from which I seldom depart. I drew on over my pajamas the heavy sweater I had brought against the river winds, poured out excellent hot coffee with shaking hand, chewed scrambled eggs and toast, and resolved to pay Blantyre a visit, even though it meant driving more than forty miles each way, to discover why still no action seemed to have taken on my memo of two years before. I put on all my thickest garments, descended, looked in the cold staterooms for the sisters, failed to find them, and decided simply to depart, as had been agreed the previous night. As I drew away my mini, I observed my wake of dust with more conscious care. There certainly was a cloud of it, a rare sight nowadays in Britain, but I still found it hard to believe that all the self-renewing perennial dust of Clamber Court came from the two drives, long though they were. I noticed that the water in the bowl of the Huntsman Fountain was patched with ice, though the jet still spurted frigidly upwards and sideways. The Immaculate Fountain was a symbol of the whole property, cold but kempt, as one might say. And one could only suppose that the responsibility and burden lay upon Miss Agnes Breakspear. Nobody who lacks direct knowledge of such a task can know how heavy it is in the conditions of today. I, with my increasing professional experience and such concerns, thought I could understand how irritating Olive Breakspear's attitude might be to Agnes Breakspear. Olive still behaved, however diminished her force, as if Clamber Court maintained itself, still took the house and how it reduced the degree at its own valuation when built. The struggle lay with Agnes, and no doubt the better part of the nation owed her a debt and others like her. All the same, I knew which of the sisters was the one to whom my greatest debt was owed. I thought sophistically that there would be little purpose in keeping up Clamour Court unless someone had at least an inkling of the style associated with dwelling there. It was a sentiment of a kind often to be discovered in the fun zone literature. Olive Breakspear also served. Still it seemed hard that dedicated to Agnes should be additionally encumbered with so much dust. The cold wind blew it around me. It penetrated cracks in the bodywork. However, shut the windows. I drove towards the little house which young Han had leased besides one of the broken down locks. It had been unoccupied for years, having neither gas nor electricity, neither water except from the river, nor road, so that a hand did not have to pay very much for it, which was just as well as the fun was all too heavily committed in other directions on his behalf. I had to leave my car by the roadside and cross two freezing fields by a muddy path. Hand and a group of six or eight other beautiful enthusiasts were frying bacon on a primus stove while the wind whistled through the broken windows. A row of Hounsfield beds, all unmade after having been slept in, was almost the only approach to furniture. The party seemed to be dressed entirely in garments from those places known as surplus stores. In every way it was an odd background for a project under the auspices of the Historic Structures Fund, though no doubt it had a certain pioneering value in its own way. Unfortunately, I arrived considerably later than the hour we had agreed, though this did not surprise me, as I had always said that the time insisted on by hand was far too early, especially as it was still winter, officially and in every other way. They were sarcastic about my lateness, and they were hardly of the type to appreciate my concern with a worrying problem of the dust, which, therefore, I did not even mention. I shall say little more of the Beauville Restoration Project, partly because most of the details are already well known, at least among those likely to be interested in them and have been the subject of an exhaustive report edited by Hand himself, though I myself think of an independent editor would have been better, and more because it is my sojourn at Clamber Court that I am describing, upon which the project impinged hardly at all. The two parts of my life at that time were almost in watertight compartments, to use the obvious but apt metaphor. Chapter 
after that rather terrible first day on the river, freezing cold and later raining as well, muddy everywhere and spent mainly, as it now seems, in pushing through endless thickets of dead bramble and dog rose with insufficiently defined authority over Hans' rough-mannered group, I returned to Clamber Court in a first-class dinner with much relief. The second evening with the Breakspear sisters, a replica of the first presented the oddest contrast to my day with Hand and his noisy friends, as can it easily be imagined. A really bitter wind was getting up, as it often does towards the end of March, but though it made the house creak a little, it did nothing to disturb the dust. At one point, I had proposed to mention the dust to Olive Breakspear, if I could find myself long enough alone with her, having at least made a start with the Grey Elizabeth, but no possible moment seemed to arise that evening. Perhaps I was too exhausted with the river to embark gratuitously upon new uncertainties. Probably I thought that I should wait until I knew the Brick Spears better, if one ever could. Only when back in my room for the night did it clearly strike me that Agnes might deliberately have prevented my being alone for more than a minute or two with Olive. Thinking back over the evening that had just passed, I could recall more than one moment when Agnes had obviously been about to fetch something or do something and when instead she had remained. The reasons for leaving us had been tiny and many people might have been dissuaded by mere inertia, but hardly I felt Agnes. She had sat on, though she had been fretful and under-occupied from the start and was then all the more fretful, no doubt, if she felt tied by the task of never taking her eyes from two people she did not trust. Could it relate to her immediate suspicion of me concerning the dust when first she saw me? Did she imagine that Olive and I were becoming affectionate? Was it merely that she did not believe in allowing Olive any unnecessary peace? Or had I altogether deceived myself? One of the moments which I found to be oddest in this generally odd way of life was the moment when I returned to the house after my day on the river. It was always evening, and always I seemed quite alone in the world, or at least in the big park. There was not even a light in the house, because Olive never turned one on unless compelled, and Agnes came back an hour or so later from undertakings which were apparently demanding, apparently unsatisfying, but never quite defined, and one could hardly inquire. Everything was silent. I had to mount the curving stone steps, and disturbed the silence by pressing a little bell push at the center of the long facade stretching through the evening from pavilion to pavilion. The illusion of the house being a vast, empty model always returned to me at this time. That there should be any living person in the huge, dark, noiseless interior seemed either absurd or sinister. But I never had to ring more than once. The grey Elizabeth always appeared after the same short interval and let me in. She never put on a light for me and I never did it for myself. I suppose we both held back out of regard for Olive. I myself found Olive's day after day passivity as unfathomable as Agnes's day after day agitation. Three or four of these days passed and I never saw Olive on a horse, though all the time she wore the same worn riding breeches and boots. It was true that I had always left fairly early and returned fairly late, and that Olive might have tended to these clothes because she looked her best in them, as many women do. All the same, I might now might have been invited to visit the stables, at least in principle. Elsewhere, it had usually happened during my first luncheon, with a time unchallengeably fixed for immediately after it, at houses where the stables still function, of course and had not been let off as a mushroom farm or school of art. Up the dark staircase I went on my fourth evening, as I see it was from my diary. While Elizabeth trailed back across the almost empty hall to the kitchen at the rear, I walked leftwards from the landing along the dark passage to my room. Then something absolutely unexpected took place. I opened the door, and I saw the back of a man standing before one of the two windows, the window not fronted by the big dressing table. He was looking out into the dark park, 
dark but not yet completely dark and of course less dark than the interior of the house i could see perhaps a little more than just his black silhouette i know exactly what happened next because i wrote it down the next morning first i stood there for quite perceptible time in plain shock and uncertainty the man must have heard me approaching and opening the door but he made no move i then switched on the three poor lights though far from sure what I ought to do next. The man did then turn, and I got a quite good view of him. He was taller than I was, young and handsome, with a prominent nose and a quantity of dark hair which curled effectively on his brow. This description makes his aspect sound like that of an artist, but in fact it was more like that of an athlete, and perhaps most of all like that of a soldier. I cite these misleading popular types only to give some idea of the impression he left upon me during the seconds I looked at him. Undoubtedly he was very well dressed in a conventional, unostentious way. He might have been a visitor to the house when the dusk had strayed into the wrong room. What he did next, however, made an idea of that kind unlikely, though not impossible. He simply walked with a quick step towards me as I stood by the door, looked straight into my eyes, of that naturally I am certain, and then without a word strode past me into the passage outside. I do not think I was more than normally upset. I noted down the next morning that I was not, but nonetheless I could find nothing to say, even though silence made me look a fool. He departed down the passage and vanished in the darkness. I made no note of how far I could hear his steps, if at all. I imagine that waiting for him to speak took all my attention, and now, of course, I have no recollection. From every point of view, I should, I suppose, have followed him, but instead I shut the door and walked over to the window where he had been standing. The floorboards were thick with dust, but there was no mark of his feet. It was when I saw this that real fear began to rise in me. The explanation that the dust had already covered the marks though not in its own way impossible to judge by what I had noticed elsewhere in the house, was by now hardly less upsetting than the notion of there being something queer about the man himself. I went through my drawers, and I accounted for all objects that I could remember to have left lying about. Nothing seemed missing. I was almost sorry. I returned to the window and looked down on the darkening park, and then something really frightening took place. It was now dark enough for my ill-lighted room to reflect itself in the glass and appear an even more ill-lighted reproduction outside, but not dark enough for the room to be all I could see beyond the window. Through the reflection of the back wall of the room, the wall behind me as I stood, I could still see the shadows of the trees and the whiteness of the intersecting drives. The outline of the huntsman fountain was clear enough quite to catch my attention. As I stared at it, I saw, or thought I saw the figure of the man I had seen, standing on the drive a short distance to my left of it. There really was not enough light to distinguish one person from another, and certainly not at anything like that distance. But I had no doubt that this figure was he. Moreover, I had never before looked from my window and seen anyone on the drive. It was a very isolated, and one could have thought, undermanned establishment. The moment I set eyes on the figure standing on the drive, I was carried away by terror so that I may not be completely reliable about what happened next. I did not seem to see the figure move, but within moments, instead of being on the drive, it was somehow within the four walls of a room that was reflected immediately before me. The reflection of the room was misshaped, as such reflections always are, and the walls were still transparent, but it was impossible to doubt where the figure now stood. Staring out petrified, I made absolutely certain, as a child might, checking in the reflected room the different objects which I knew were in the real room behind me, and among them the figure stood. I know, as will be seen, that at this point I cried out, those who deem this e either weak of me or incredible are invited to find themselves in a like situation. But I did manage to turn myself round to confront the intruder, 
perhaps because it was even worse to suppose he was standing out of my sight. I found I was alone in the room. I stared at its emptiness to make quite sure, and then looked back at the reflected room. That was now empty also, apart from my own vaguely reflected shape in the foreground. I fell into an armchair. There was a knock at my door, and I thought that the manner of it was familiar. Come in. It was the great Elizabeth who had knocked as when she brought my breakfast. I rose to my feet. I don't quite know why. Miss Breakspear says she heard something and asked me to find out whether anything was wrong. On the instant, I decided to plunge. When I came in here a few minutes ago, a man was standing by the window looking out. Yes, sir, was all the great Elizabeth said. What do you mean by that? Who was he? Other people have supposed they saw him. Annoyance rose in me to drive out fear. Are you saying that I've been given some kind of haunted room? Certainly not, sir. People have seen him in many different rooms. But you won't see him again. No one has ever seen him more than once. Have you seen him? No, sir. Who is he? That's not for me to know. She looked and spoke as if I had asked her something improper. Then I shall ask one of the Miss Breakspears. Please don't do that, sir. The tale upsets the Miss Breakspears very much. Let's just keep it to ourselves, sir. I'll tell Miss Breakspear that you cried out because you'd cut yourself. It sounded utterly absurd. It reminded me of the suggestions that the dust in the house came from the drives. But I haven't cut myself. Yes, you have, sir. Look. It was not the least astonishing thing. There was quite a bad gash on the soft part of my left hand, the area between the little finger and the wrist. Half of my hand was greasily wet with blood. I did not know how I had done it, and I never learned. Possibly it had happened while I was blundering about the room a few minutes earlier. Let me get the first aid box, said the great Elizabeth. It was scarcely practical to object. She departed and soon came back with it. The funds rules require that at least one box of this kind be kept at every property because the public visitors manage to do the most extraordinary things to themselves. The great Elizabeth bound me up quite skillfully, so skillfully that I had to congratulate her. Miss Breakspear taught me, she said. She's a qualified trained nurse. It was obvious that the great Elizabeth admired Agnes. I had noticed it before. And now, sir, said Elizabeth, finishing me off. If I promise that you'll see nothing ever again, Will you please promise me that you'll not speak about what you've seen to the Miss Breakspears? It seemed to me an excessive request. They shouldn't have people to stay in a haunted house without warning them. They seldom do, sir. With respect, sir, you'll recall that you were not invited by either Miss Breakspear. It could hardly be denied. And therefore, sir, I'm quite sure you'll agree that it would be better to leave private things unspoken. This exceedingly plain hint brought back to me at other properties of the fun I had sometimes stumbled upon privacies that I should have preferred to be ignorant of, and that occasionally small difficulties had ensued. You'll know better than I do, sir, that in houses where things such as we're talking about are supposed to happen, the owners often don't care for them to be spoken of. That, too, I did know, and the fun's psychic and occult committee had since been much impeded by it. But I was still doubtful, as was only natural. How can I be sure that nothing more will happen? Those to whom anything happens, finds that it happens only once. In this house, anyway, replied the great Elizabeth with the most convincing confidence. I might be an exception. Even if you are, sir, you wouldn't wish to do a hurt to the two ladies. The truth was that by now I knew in my bones that it was not a thing to talk about with his sisters. I could not even imagine how I could possibly begin. All right, I said to the great Elizabeth. All right, if nothing more happens. Suddenly, Agnes Breakspear appeared in the doorway, wearing one of her dark dresses. Whatever is going on? Elizabeth, why didn't you come back to tell me? Mr. Ogle, Oxenhope, are you hurt? I foolishly managed to cut myself, and Elizabeth has been binding me up. So that evening passed like the three previous ones. When the time came for bed, I certainly cannot say that I was easy in my mind, but I thought that I could rely upon 
the Grey Elizabeth. I had gone through an exhausting day in the open with Hand and his intolerable gang, and I soon fell asleep. When Elizabeth brought me breakfast, I felt that we were parties to a bargain, and took advantage of this to make some new exploratory remark about the dust. Old houses are always full of dust, she replied, calmly avoiding my eye. Do what you will. A gentleman in your position must know that better than I do. And she went without making or asking a question as she usually did about the contents of the tray being to my liking. That day was Saturday, but Han had pointed out that so far from the weekend being a holiday, it was the time when we could expect the number of volunteers to be doubled. This was obvious enough, but I must have looked put out, because Han had gone on to say that he was sure they could manage on their own if I cared to miss the Saturday and Sunday. But I was certain that something appalling would happen in my absence, so did not avail myself of his suggestion. For example, friction had already begun with the Riverside farmers, as any one could have foreseen, and Hand was only waiting his chance to deal with them, forcefully, so that the name of the fund would quite probably have been dragged into the national press. For weeks the local paper had contained little but correspondence about the scheme and statements concerning it from mayors, chairmen of councils, and businessmen, the great majority adverse, as could well be understood. The editor had also published two long letters from Hand himself, but both so aggressive and so clever in the wrong way that they could only have done more harm than good. Hand was never able to understand the kind of objections that normal, reasonable people feel to operations that directly forward none of their interests. The majority liked to confine any idealism they may have to approved outlets and not let it enter their immediate environments and working lives. This may or may not be sensible and admirable, but it is a fact of life. Han could never really grasp it. At weekends on the river, there were even girl volunteers, or more probably girls, who followed boys who had volunteered. So the chaos and confusion were worse than ever. Some of the volunteers showed qualities that were doubtless in many ways excellent, even though ill-adapted to the world of today, when everything at all serious is settled by agreement, manifest there behind the scenes. I should not necessarily have been opposed even to the scheme itself, provided that the fund had not been required to assist with it, let alone I personally. The central mistake was in the commitment of the fund to anything so harebrained and explosive. All the same, I plowed on through a welter of mud and a continuous bitter wind, doing my best among people with whom I had little in common, if only because I was older and had been so much more of the world than they had. And every evening I returned to the vast, dusky, silent house, ascended to the room where I had made that strange encounter, hung my clothes out to dry, scraped the worst off the mud off my boots onto a sheet of local newspaper, lay on my bed for half an hour, and then went down to Olive, playing out her endless dreams on the music room piano. She sometimes spoke, but never stopped playing, or offered me a drink until Agnes stepped could be heard in the stone-paved hall. Where I left my car at the front of the house, Agnes left hers at the back, and entered through the kitchen quarters. When she came into the music room, she was always the first to speak, and seldom much more agreeably than on my first evening. It was plain that Olive's habitual silence irritated her in itself, and none could understand how this might be when Agnes had to live with Olive year after year. Nor could I doubt that there were other things than silence about Olive that irritated Agnes. Agnes always wore one of the woolen dresses I have mentioned. I saw three or four of them in all. I imagined that unlike Olive, she to this extent changed for dinner. I had not so far set eyes on her at any other time of the day. Agnes has usually made some formal inquiry about the progress of the river project to which I made a formal reply, and nothing more than ever said on the subject, somewhat to my relief. We talked about Agnes's local preoccupations, with Olive sometimes breaking her silence to be sarcastic, though only mildly and gently so. We discussed topics in which no one of us succeeded in interesting any of the others for a moment. Agnes produced a large embroidery frame, and discated away the hours without, to my mind, producing anything very beautiful. The work was for presentation at Christmas to the meeting place of a woman's organization in a nearby town. 
One evening, I remember, we talked about the fund itself. Agnes was not very cordial. Since the property was settled on the fund, she asserted, we haven't been able to call our souls our own. I had heard something of the kind from other tenants, so cannot say that I was exactly shocked. The fund has the ungrateful task of having to meet the requirements of the state, I replied. It does all it can to soften the wind to the shorn lamb. By this time, it could do more to stop the wind blowing, said Agnes. This for me was too much after the style of hand. I had been listening to such tiresome talk all day. The fun has to keep out of all controversy, I said, with such deliberate firmness as I could achieve. If it didn't, it wouldn't be permitted to hold property, and your house might have been pulled down by now or become an institution. Our house, exclaimed Agnes with bitterness. The tenants all feel the same, and I suppose one cannot blame them. Since the fun took over, we've been living here on sufferance, almost on charity. Our lives have ceased to be our own. We are unpaid curators. The nobility in Poland, who have had their estates stolen, are sometimes permitted to go on curating a few rooms in their former homes. Though in England, it is dressed up, that is, our position, and nothing more. At least it is my position. I can't speak for Olive. Olive was lying back on her usual chair before the fire. Her legs stretched out, her hands beneath her head. Oh, I agree, she said. We are simply waiting. Soon it will all be gone. The fund, I pointed out, likes to keep members of the family living in the house. The public doesn't take to museums, and very few of them know or care anything about architecture or pictures. What appeals to them is getting into someone else's home and having the right to poke about inside it. It is only on that basis that the fun keeps going. It may or may not be sensible and admirable, but it's a fact of life, and we all have to do our best to accept it, even though I quite see it's often not easy. You can't live in a house you no longer own, said Agnes. The choices, the decisions, the responsibilities are no longer yours. You are at the best a housekeeper, at the worst a dummy. Not that people in any way cease to hate and envy you. Often they hate and envy you more because they've seen more. The difference is that you're tied down and deprived of any redress against them. I hope you'll agree from what you've seen that I'm an efficient housekeeper, but I spend as little time in the house as possible. I get away as much as I can, even if what goes on outside the walls is often frustrating too. It won't last at Olive. It can't last. Not even in Poland. My job is to see that it does last, I said, smiling, or at least it is the job of my colleagues. We should have fought harder for ourselves, said Agnes. We should have put up more of a struggle, she spoke at once merely placing an opinion on record, not even attempting to convince, not expecting in the least to be agreed with. Here she differed from hand, who would have begun to make immediate plans, however impractical. An irritation of our age is the collapse of the rules concerning names. My hostesses had still not begun to address me as Nugent, no doubt owing to my invidious position, of which, like many of the other tenants, they were so excessively conscious. And in that same position, it was hardly for me to begin calling them Agnes and Olive. On the other hand, the old-fashioned formalities would have seemed strained, would have caused the very embarrassment they were designed to eliminate. We never altogether reached a settlement of this problem. No doubt that it was symbolical. It was a house in which the rules lingered, because a house in which it was otherwise impossible to live with decency, but the rules, like Olive Break's spear, now lacked force, let alone fire. Often I thought about Olive, about her square mouth, her slenderness, her lovely hands, her air of poetical mystery, but though there had seemed to be a certain understanding between us from the start, she took care to add not one twig, to the tiny flame, one brick to the rudimentary fabric. Probably she no longer had twigs or bricks in her store. I found that Agnes was beginning to talk much more to me, even when there was most of the time at me. This whole thing about us and the fund is grotesque, she would exclaim. Don't you think so? Or she would suddenly make a wide and difficult inquiry. What do you think of Dutch barns? The fund must have more experience of them than I have. Or are there any really good people working for the fund? Is there even one? 
once she suddenly asked, What is your own candid view of my sister Olive? And this, with Olive sitting there as usual, silent and indifferent, unless directly addressed. At least it all ended towards sheer dullness, and the food and drink continued as good as a general maintenance, and the dust remained. By then, snatching thirty minutes here and thirty minutes there, I had prowled half across five parishes looking for cement works, but had failed to find one. And next came the incident of the dust cloud at dawn. Each night, worn with the burden of communication, we went to bed rather early. I was usually quite ready for it, so hard was my life on the river, in a way I suppose so healthy, albeit un unenjoyable. I used to fall asleep immediately, and every night, though less of the intruder I had seen, but I found that on most mornings I awoke early. The truth was that as in many country houses, far too long was officially set aside for slumber. I would awake, and in the cold gray light, see by the ticking French clock that it was only six or even earlier, whereas Elizabeth could not be expected to arrive with my breakfast until half past seven. Sometimes I climbed out of bed and walked several times up and down the rooms in my pajamas, deliberately chilling myself, having learned from experience elsewhere that to change from cold air to warm sheets and blankets often sends one more quickly back to sleep than anything else. At that hour, the fountain huntsman looked both more, more alive and more mythological than when he stood transfixed and obsolete in the rushing world. One felt that he was the single living man in square miles of farm-haunted landscape. As I stumped about looking for new sleep, I glanced out at him, even when I had to scrub the frost off the panes to see him. On one of those early mornings, I saw something else. The park was greatly lit, lightly frosted, and as far as I could see and hear, perfectly impopulated and still an excellent world, in fact, for a stone man to hunt in. As I looked out, excited, I admit, by the cold, quiet beauty of the scene, I saw a cloud of dust bowling along the white drive from among the trees on the left. A globe of dust might better describe it. It was possibly ten or twelve feet high and quite dense, and though more or less spherical, dragged the dusty train behind it like a messy comet. The dust looked almost black in the faint dawn light, but I was sure it was really gray, the perfectly ordinary gray one would expect. It rolled along quite steadily towards the fountain, and in the apparent absence of any wind, I thought at once that it must be raised by some small heavy vehicle, or any way moving object, at the invisible center of it. The invisibility was especially odd, however. One would expect to have seen something of such a vehicle, probably the front of it, butting out from the cloud that followed it. I was so carried away that I actually opened one of the heavy sash windows with their thick gazing bars and listened for the noise of an engine. I could hear nothing at all, not even awakening rooks and hedgehoppers. Looking further out, I saw the dust cloud roll on until it reached the intersection of drives at the fountain, and then the episode ended in total anticlimax. Somehow the cloud was not there at all. It could not really have blown away because there was no wind, and that quite often from the question of there having presumably been some solid object to cause it, though still none was visible. I could not even say that I had seen the cloud disperse. It was more as if I had been so concentrated on the movement and character of the cloud that I had been half asleep to particulars of its dissolution to development so unanticipated. Any way there was now neither cloud nor cause for cloud, nothing but the cold still morning with the stone huntsman perched half iced at the center of it. I shut the window, shivered a little, and returned to bed, though not to sleep. In fact, it was the seeming freak of nature that I have described, which really propelled me to Blantyre. That same morning I drove round to Hans Lock Cottage, told the assembled volunteers that other funds business coming unexpectedly would compel me to be missing from the river that day, made no reference to the rather obvious looks of relief which followed my words and drove off to Bagglesham, where Blantyre, the funds regional representative, operated from his crumbling half-timbered house in a side street. It had once belonged to a family of pargeters, and legend said one could still smell the dung that went into a special kind of plaster, 
but that was a paranormal manifestation that never came my way. Basil Blantyre, who had since unfortunately died, still in harness, was already nearer to 80 than to 70 and sensibly reluctant to leave the warm fire in March weather, but he welcomed me and most cordially, though I had not been able to tell him I was coming. There was a telephone at Clamber Court, but I had never heard it in use, and thought that a call to the fund's local luminary could, if overheard, cause only trouble. Blantyre most kindly made me a cup of instant coffee with his own hands. He lived quite alone, his wife having never fully recovered, as had been given by Hamish Haythorne to understand, from the shock of the bankruptcy and the compulsion to leave the house where the Blantyre family had lived, reputedly since the Middle Ages. To Blantyre, as to me and others, the fun had proved a welcome haven from life's storm. I want the lowdown on Clamber Court and the Breakspear sisters, I said, pushing back the scum on the hot coffee. There was a lot of sadness in the family. I speak of the time before Clamber was settled on the fund. There hasn't been much happiness since, judging by what I've seen and heard. What can you expect, Oxenhope? People don't like losing their houses and still living on in them. That at least Millicent and I were spared. Quite possibly this was a form of sour grapes, as the Blantyre house had been much too far gone for any decision but demolition. There may be more to it than that, I said. What splendid coffee. There seemed to be some odd goings on at Clamber Court. So I've heard, said Blantyre, looking away from me and into the blazing logs. To start with, the Breakspear girls appear to have no visitors, apart, of course, from the public. Poor old dears, exclaimed Blantyre vaguely. They're not as old as that. I acknowledge that I find myself one of them quite attractive. So, exclaimed Blantyre in the same vague way, it was manifest that he long ago lost all touch with the clamber situation. And then I said, the house is full of dust. Yes, said Blantyre, I know. That's just it. That's just what, I asked, putting down my cup. The second half of the contents was thick and muddy. Blantyre did not answer. After a pause, he answered with another question. Did you see something else, or hear? See, I said, lowering my voice as one does, even though it was still the middle of the morning. Not here. You saw him, asked Blantyre. I think so, I said. I suppose so. And it? You perhaps saw it as well? Yes, I said, this very morning as a matter of fact. You don't say so, Blantyre turned back towards me. If what I saw was the same it, I have no doubt of it, replied Blantyre. I first saw the dust, the ordinary dust, when I visited the house two years ago. I went into cognito, you know. You should never do that, said Blantyre very seriously. Coming from a man almost twice my age, I let the reproof go. At the time, I sent you a memo on the dust, I said. I don't wonder many people do. You mean that there's nothing to be done about it? What do you think about that, asked Blantyre, now that you've had more experience? The servant says it blows off the long drives. So it does, said Blantyre, in a way. Here he started coughing rather alarmingly, as if the dust had entered his own lungs. "'Can't I get you something?' I asked. "'No, thank you,' Blantyre wheezed. "'Just give me a minute or two. You haven't finished your coffee.' I swallowed a little more, and then sat looking into the fire, as Blantyre had done. Before long his breath seemed to be coming more easily. Will you please tell me the story, I asked, still staring at the logs. All within the four walls of the fund, of course. You mean that I shan't last long? That I ought to pass it on before I go? Of course not. I never thought of such a thing. After all, the Breakspear girls must know, and almost certainly Elizabeth and doubtless others. Not many others, said Blantyre. Or only village tales. If the fun has to have official knowledge of the story. It is my successor I should tell. But I don't know who he'll be, and I dare say I shall never meet him. So I am prepared to tell you. You've been staying in the house, I believe. Spending nights there? Yes, I said, and still am. All thanks to young Mr. Hand. 
There's a good lad, said Blantyre unexpectedly. It's a bad thing for England that there's not more like him. Who knows if you're not right, but you can be glad you don't have to work with him. Men of the best type are seldom easy to work with. Being easy to work with is a talent that often doesn't call for any other talents in support of it. I said nothing, again, remembering Blantyre's age. This time the gulf between the generations positively yawned at my feet. If you're called upon to live in the house, said Blantyre, you've possibly a claim to the story. Not that I've heard of actual harm coming to anyone. Not physical harm, anyway. Only to Tony Tilbury, who was killed. But he was just run over. I don't follow, I said. The one certain fact is that Tony Tilbury was run down and killed early one morning by a car which Agnes Breakspear was driving. Oh, I said, feeling a little sick. Olive Breakspear saw it happen from one of the windows. That's another fact, at least I suppose so. There is considerable doubt as to how far her account of the details can be relied on. I shouldn't have thought it was an easy place to have an accent of that kind, especially with nothing else about. You're not the only person to have thought that, and in fact, if it hadn't been for Olive's evidence, Agnes would have been in serious trouble. A manslaughter charge, at least. Even murder, perhaps. Who was Tony Tilbury? He was a fine-looking young chap, descended from one of Queen Elizabeth's admirals. I met him myself several times, when we were still in the old place. Then I think you may have seen him for yourself, what he looked like, if we understood one another just now. The thing was that Tilbury and Olive Breakspear were in love, very much in love, people say, and Agnes objected. You mean she was in love with him herself? Perhaps, said Blantar. That's one of the many things that no one knows, or can be expected to know, unless one of the sisters speaks up. And I should say that's pretty unlikely by this time. But there's no doubt at all about the rows it all caused between them. There were plenty of people who were quite prepared, or said they were, to swear to having seen Agnes settling about Olive, and even threatening to kill her. That seems an unlikely thing to threaten before witnesses. It's what people said, whether they would really have taken an oath on it when it came to the point, is needless to say another matter. It never did come to a point of that kind, because Olive swore at the inquest that she had seen the whole thing from one of the windows, and that the car had quite obviously got out of control. She swore that she saw Agnes struggling with it and doing all she could be expected to do. Even so, there was quite a lot of unanswered questions when it had come down to running down a solitary man in all that open space. And apparently Olive, at one point, half admitted that she couldn't really see because of all the dust which the dust which the car had stirred up. Agnes made a big thing of the dust, too, in her own evidence. She put a lot of the blame on it. In the end, the coroner gave Agnes the benefit of the doubt, and the jury brought in accidental death. I dare say the dust was pretty decisive, however you look at it. It can get into people's eyes like smoke. That's not the only dusty verdict I've known to come from a coroner's jury. Inquests often take place in rather a rush, oddly enough, though I didn't attend the one on Tony Tilbury. Why did people suppose he was standing about all by himself at that hour of a winter morning? It wasn't winter, said Blantar. It was pretty nearly midsummer, hence all the dust. Oh, I said, I hadn't realized. Blantar wanted for me to go on. At Clamber, there seems dust enough at all at any time. Even so, what was Tilbury doing? Agnes and Olive told a story about Tilbury sleeping badly and often going out in the early hours to walk about the park. I dare say it was more or less true, but what people said was something different. They said that on the morning in question, Tilbury was about to elope with Olive. A far-fetched thing to do in all the circumstances, but the two of them were said to have been driven to it by Agnes's behavior. The idea seemed to me to leave a lot of unanswered questions also, and I don't know that there's any real evidence for it at all.
Tilbury's own car, a racing sort of thing, was found in the background along the river, but there was nothing very remarkable about that. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure that the whole business, queer though it was, would have started so many tales, or at least kept the tales going for so long, had it not been for one or two other things. What were they, I asked. In the first place, Olive had a complete breakdown after the inquest. Or so, once again, it was said. I suppose one can't be certain even of that. All that is certain is that she was missing for more than a year. And when she came back, she had changed. She had intended to be a professional pianist, as you possibly know, perhaps before she met Tony Tilbury. Even that was odd, the effect that Tilbury appears to have had on her. Tilbury was an agreeable young chap and good-looking, of course, but perfectly ordinary, as far as I could ever see. And it was hard to imagine why a sensitive, artistic creature like Olive should, should be so gone on him in particular. But I think she really was gone on him. I don't think there's much doubt about that. I'm told they behaved quite absurdly together, even in public. Anyway, when she came back, after more than a year from wherever it had been, She'd given up music and gone nuts on writing, and not the usual sort of writing either, but endless treks all by herself. She still does it, or did, the last I heard. But you'll probably know more about that than I do. Olive still plays the piano as well, I said, whenever Agnes lets her. I see, said Blantyre, looking at me in the eye. Well, there you are. I mean, as to the relationship between them. You've summed it up from your own observation. I'd believe almost anything about the relationship, but what's the next reason why people still talk? Do you have to ask? You're not the only one to have seen things and heard things, or to have said they've seen and heard them. Not that I wish to reflect any doubt upon you personally, you understand. Elizabeth told me that no one sees anything more than once. At least she said that no one sees what I now take to have been Tilbury's figure more than once. Did she now? That's a new superstition to me, but it follows a familiar line, of course. And when things like that are alive at all, they always grow. Also, I haven't been to Clamour for some year time. That's probably something I shouldn't admit. I just don't like the place, and between ourselves, I don't go out much more than I can help in any case unless it happens to be said fair weather. Elizabeth implied that people have seen him in many different rooms in the house. I suspect, replied Blantyre, that he's just in the whole place, and that the people who see him do so when they happen to be in the right mood. What exactly that means, I have no idea, but another theory that are supposed to explain these things goes very far, as you may have noticed. All telepathy, people say, for example, what does it mean, whether it's true or not. It gets one almost no distance at all, though it may perhaps just be worth saying. I claim no more for what I have just suggested about Tony Tilbury at Clamber. And from what you say, we know no more about what those three people were doing all up and about so early in the morning? Not a thing. Never ever shall in all probability... Of course, the father had died years before. As a matter of fact, he killed himself. So much seems certain, though they succeeded in hushing it up. I've never come upon so much as a rumor as to his reasons. The older people who knew him just say he was always seemed depressed, or always seemed aloof, or some such word. All in all, they're not a lucky family. The mother went queer after her husband's death, though she's still alive. I was told in the fund's offices that she lived in the house. I don't think so, said Blantyre, smiling a little. It's the sort of thing that I should be notified officially, wouldn't you say? I suspect it's another example of the growth that's taken place in the absence of facts. Or have you heard the old thing screaming in the night above your head? Never, I replied. Well, I hope you don't. It's not a pleasant sound, I assure you. Blantyre spoke as if it were one with which he was thoroughly familiar. And that reminds me, he said, went on. I shouldn't be frightened of clamor if I were you, or let it get me down. I mention this because there might be the tendency of some of the things I've said. I think it is quite unnecessary. It's true that I don't like the place, 
but it's far more true that no one was ever hurt by a ghost yet, unless he made use of the ghost to hurt himself. Ghosts don't hit you over the head. You do it yourself when you're not thinking about it, and blame them for it because you can't understand yourself. A homely illustration, but all the records confirm the truth of it. It's only in fiction that there's anything really dangerous. And of course, old houses do tend to dust up when their families no longer own them, though that's not a line of thought we are permitted to pursue. So, now let me make you another cup of coffee. Despite Blantyre's reassurances, I was therefore really afraid not only of Clamor Court, but of the two sisters as well. Fortunately, I had only four more nights to stay there, because my nights had become as forbidding as my days. Driving back from seeing Blantyre, I actually came upon Olive on her horse, visibly now a rather elderly animal, though once, I had no doubt, a nice roan. Despite all the references to riding, I had never seen her mounted before, probably because I had always before driven about the countryside either too early or too late. The horse was stepping out slowly towards me, along a very minor road. The reins were quite loose in Olive's hand. There seemed little chance of the desperate galloping and charging that Agnes had implied was Olive's manner of equi equation. Though I could well believe that Olive was entirely capable of such things, perhaps even longed for them. Possibly it was what once she did, but did no more. The weather was as bleak as ever, with a bitter wind getting up under a cold sky, but Olive wore a sand-colored shirt, open at the neck, and so old that when I came up with her, I saw little tears in it. When first I saw her, she was looking up at the gray, almost white heavens, while the horse found his own way. There was no reason why she should have taken any notice of my car nowadays, one of so many in the lanes, had I not slowed almost to a stop, because of the horse and because it was Olive. She met my eyes through the windscreen, even smiled a little, and raised her hand in greeting like a female center. She made no sign of stopping or speaking, but rode slowly on. I watched her for a few seconds through my rear window, noticing the small tears in her shirt, noticing and admiring the straightness of her back, the sleekness of her hair, the perfection of her posture. Although I had stayed for a simple lunch with Blantyre because he seemed lonely and pressed it upon me, and because it hardly seemed worth visiting the river for a short spell of failing light, I arrived back at Clamber Court much earlier than usual. Naturally, the Grey Elizabeth looked surprised. I've been visiting Mr. Blantyre, local representative, I said. It was an explanation that was unlikely to be well received, and Elizabeth's surprise duly changed to hostility and suspicion. Aren't we doing what they want, she asked. Of course you are. I was only passing the time of day with him but I cannot deny that, going along the familiar passage to my room, I felt very quavery. I even hesitated before opening my door. The room, however, was merely much lighter than it usually was when I came back to it. An indefensible thought struck me. For the first time, I was more or less alone in the house, and it was still daylight. I resolved to look about, starting with the room next to my own, or at least to try the door. It was better, I thought, to know than not to know. Still in my overcoat, I tiptoed back into the passage. There were little cold draughts, and I pushed back my own door as far as it would go. I did not want it to slam and bring upstairs the Grey Elizabeth. I did not want it to make a noise of any kind or to shut me out. The door of the next room was, lock was locked. It was only to be expected. I did something even more indefensible. I removed the key from the lock of my own door and tried it in the lock of the next door. My thought was that when the house had been built, an operation of this kind would have had small chances of success, but that the 1910 contractor, who had plainly made big changes, might well have installed new locks that were not merely standard but identical. I was right. The lock stuck a bit, but I made the key turn. I did not just peek in, but threw the door wide open, though at the same time, I did it as quietly as I could. The room was empty of furniture, but the air was charged with moving dust. 
It was almost as thick as the snow and those snowstorm glasses one used to buy from peddlers in Oxford Street. Moreover, it seemed to move in the same slow dreary swirl as moves the toy snow when the glass is reversed and the fall begins. There was a bitter wind outside the house, as I have said, and draughts inside it. But the room was fusty and stuffy, and I could not see how the March wind could explain anything. Not that it mattered, at least to begin with, for though the wheeling dust I could see that the window of the empty room a figure stood, with its back to me, looking out towards the park. It was Agnes dressed in her day clothes, and I could see another key of the room lying on the window sill. She had locked herself in. I had been wrong in taking it for granted that at that hour she would every day be occupied with her committee and public works. So much time passed while I just gazed through the terrifying dust at Agnes's motionless back that I really thought I might succeed in shutting the door and getting away. But exactly as I was nerving myself to move, and to move quietly, Agnes turned and looked at me. I know it's no longer our house, my sister's and mine, she said, but still you are our guest, Mr. Oxenhope, even if only in a sense. I apologize, I said. I had no idea the room was not empty. I had been seeing Mr. Blantyre today. Unfortunately, he's not very well, and there are one or two things I thought I should check on his behalf before the house opens to the public. Of course, it is what we expect and have become accustomed to. I am not complaining. What else would you like to see? The key of your room doesn't open to every door. I don't think any of the other little items will involve keys, I replied, though thank you very much. As for this room, I only wanted to make sure it was empty because we should like to store a few things in it. There are other empty rooms in the house, said Agnes, and I am sure we can spare this one. All the same, I do apologize again for not speaking to you first. It was simply that I had little time on my hands, as today I haven't visited the river. It is no longer our house, said Agnes, so that, strictly speaking, there is no obligation on you to ask us about anything. Has Mr. Blantyre any criticisms of my housekeeping? None, I assured her. We agreed that it is one of the best maintained of all the fund's many properties. And interestingly enough, the dust had by then ceased to swirl, though I am sure it still lay thick on the room floor, the floors of the other rooms, the passages, the stairs, the furniture, and all our hearts.